Today, I had an amazing conversation with Bill Perkins, a successful hedge fund manager, entrepreneur, and author of Die With Zero, Getting All You Can From Your Money and Your Life, which teaches you a plan for optimizing your life stage by stage so you're fully engaged and enjoying what you've worked and saved for, with the goal being to optimize our lives for net fulfillment at the right time at each stage of life. This conversation will change how you think about saving and retirement forever. I hope you enjoy. Bill, welcome to the Growth Guide podcast. Before we start by diving into your book, Die With Zero, can you give the audience a brief introduction to yourself so they know your background and history before we start talking the book? Wow, thanks for having me. But uh, being 54, that's all. Let, let me let me give you this super condensed version. <laughs> Grew up in Jersey City, uh, went to school at the University of Iowa, uh, started as a assistant peon on the New York Mercantile Exchange, which means I was a clerk's assistant. I was at the bottom of the barrel, sneaking sandwiches on the floor, kind of worked my way through uh, learning clerking, brokering, eventually got recruited to come to Houston as a trader, worked at a company called El Paso Energy, journeyman through trading. My friend John Arnold started a hedge fund called Centaurus Energy, joined there, got rich. He got richer. He called <laughs> in rich, retired. I started my own hedge fund, family office, Done movies, played poker, have startups, you know, have family office, that type of stuff. So here I am. Uh, I still have today uh, some startups that I do, some small, small, small VC investments for the family office, living life, trying to find balance. Trying to find balance and trying to die with zero. So Correct. we're gonna we're gonna dive into what that means. And it seems like one of the fables or stories that you heard growing up somewhat tied into your desire to get to this answer. And that was the story of the ant and the grasshopper. And you having a realization, well, wait a second, when does the ant actually get to play? Can, can you tell her readers about that and how it had such an impact on you? Well, I, I, I would say like that was kind of, I'd never had like this one epiphany moment, right? It's not just this one thing. It's kind of all these things, like when you're thinking about it, like the story of the ant and a grasshopper and the ants are just like work, work, work. And I was like, well, what kind of life is that? Right. But that was in conjunction with being broke on the, uh, going to wall street particularly commodities, trying to get rich and, and thinking about, well, what is it for? What am I getting rich for? You know, why do I want to be rich before I'm 30? You know, and all, all these kinds of thoughts about, I think everybody has these thoughts, like, what is it for? What does it all mean? What am I here to do with my life? Right. And you kind of, even in college, when I was in engineering school, they would have career day. And, you know, I remember the IBM rep coming in and I asked a question about entrepreneurialism inside of IBM. Like, could you, if you had an idea and they were like, no, you'd be working on it. This is your career path. You know, you'd work on a subsection of a chip, right? <laughs> and you would be tasked with making that part, you know, better, stronger, faster, whatever it is, what you were doing in signals processing or whatever, whatever it was. And after X year, this is your salary and X year, whatever. And it was all kind of laid out. And I was like, it felt like death to me. Right. And I was kind of thinking about like, what fulfills me? What does that mean? What time? I didn't, you know, work to play, et cetera. So I, I was always having questions of like balance and how to get the most out of life, right? From, from college to first job, et cetera. And then I was thinking as, you know, you're going to make money, how does that relate to money? Like, well, What's the proper amount of money to have? What is enough? And I, I think the concept of enough didn't even come to me until I read the book, Your Money or Your Life. Very impactful. Very, very impactful on my thought process. And w when you look at that, the thing that you said jumped out at you in Your Money or Your Life, and we're, we're, we're fast forwarding, but we'll probably jump around a lot in our convo, was the idea of trading consumption for hours worked. So you'd yeah. start to look at it and say, well, wait a second, that's two hours of my life. I'm not doing right. that 
And then you took it a step further, which, which I loved. And th there's a theme of your engineering mind really coming out throughout this book and the concepts you had, because you not only did it for money, which I've heard before, but you took it to calories. So yeah. am I, am I, am I going to eat that cookie or not? Well, wait a second. That's another two hours on the treadmill. Do I want the cookie? Let's yeah. test the cookie. Let's have a bite. And then let's figure out if we want the whole cookie or not. Yeah. So, so how, how did that have such an influence? And can you explain to the listeners, like, what is this concept of trading X hours of work for Y hours of consumption that you want to buy? Yeah. So in the book, they, they go through kind of one of the things you figure out is, what is an hour of your time worth? And it's a very didactic, painful process. So they have you list all your sources of income and your after-tax income, then all that it takes to get there, including your costumes, whether you have to wear a suit or not, your transportation time, decompression time, anything associated with work, right? So the, And then you divide that out, right? It's just simple division. Once you s sat down and thought, okay, to work, I have to, you know, I commute an hour plus eight hours of work plus I have to these expenses with getting to work, right? Th those get subtracted out. And then you come up with your true hourly wage. And then the next step is the, you look at every single expense in dollars. Okay. So you have, these are the things you're buying. And then the next exercise, since you're so well versed in like your time is to remove the money and just think of it an hour's work. Right. So once you know you're so so that that you have this visceral experience and I understand why they make you go through it so painfully, so detailed for a week is because when you convert it to time, it, it literally is like stepping into the matrix. You see the whole world differently. Right. Everything you think in time, like you go to the dentist and it's like, oh, I have to spend, you know, a day and a half to go see my dentist. You know, this shirt costs an hour of my time, this movie, an hour and a half of my time. And you start to think, wow, I, I, would I work an hour and a half to have an hour and a half of entertainment? You quickly start to get a lot, your values start to pop up, right? You're like, wait, would I really, you know, do I really want that shirt that bad? Do I really want to go to this movie that bad? Well, I need to go to the dentist. So, so be it. <laughs> you know, and that made me think I need to increase the value of an hour of my time. You know, you know, I also thought about it in terms of like, I have an optimal health that I want to maintain. Right. Extra mm. calories that you don't consume wind up through some process being shoved into stored as fat. Right. If, uh, and so and then that causes all types of health concerns. And so if I'm going to have this chocolate chip cookie and they're not 200 calories nowadays, they're like, you know, they're 400. You know, it's these cal these cookies are calorically dense, uh, nutri nutrient light. But uh, I'm like, is it worth you know, I, I, when I work out on a treadmill, pretty hard, you know, on an incline three and a half, about an hour is, is 600 calories, right? Hard, right? Three and a half, let's call it a three, 3.3, 3 3.5 miles per hour pace walking on a 15 degree in, incline, right? And so it's about 600 calories, right? And then I have to subtract out 100 calories because if I just sit around and do nothing, I burn a 100 calories. So it's only 500 extra calories of burn. Right. So, so when I sit there and I look at the cookie, I'm like, shit, I really don't like work walking on the treadmill. Do I really want an extra hour on a treadmill or a treadmill equivalent, right, of work expenditure in order to burn this cookie? And that concept came from like time, like everything is time to, uh, you know, a conversion of time. Like I, we're all exchanging time and you're getting fractions. Like when I go fly on a plane, I'm getting fractions of people's time. Right. The pilot, mm. their stewardess, the person who made the plane, the Boeing, you know, amortize. Right. And I'm like exchanging whatever the ticket costs. Right. You know, 10, 20, 30, 40 hours of your time, depending on what it is, in exchange for this transportation, uh, rapid transportation to another destination. Right. That was probably one of the most impactful things that hit me. Just, you know, my way of thinking changed, but it also changed my motivation. So it, most people, when they read uh, Your Money or Your Life, it spawns a, a sense of frugality right away. Yeah, because it, you get, that's you right. get aligned with your values and you get this concept of enough. Like, I don't really, like, do I really need that fancy car? Do I really, like, a, you know, like you, 
you start like, do I, would I really give up hours of my life? The only thing I have, right? Like for, for, for this. And, and you, it really forces you to think about what your values are. And that book spawned the fire movement, the financial independence retire early, which is people who are extremely frugal um, and then look to be independently wealthy, wealthy. And I'm air quoting because wealth is defined by each person. Like it's the concept of enough plus a little bit more. Right. But what I took away from that being that I'm kind of disturbed <laughs> human being is that I want an hour of my time to be worth thousands of hours of other people's time. Right. So I, I, I didn't say, Hey, I want to be frugal. I, I just went, I want to be extremely wealthy. So I don't have to worry. I don't want to do these calculations. I don't want to have to think about it, right? Like I, it's, it's immaterial. I don't think in seconds, I think in hours, and this is a second or five second or 10 seconds of my time. That's kind of the direction. That was my motivation after reading the book. And, and that's what I, what I really zoned in on while you were talking about it is, is the significant difference between your approach and the fire approach. And whenever I write about financial independence, so many people talk about the lower your expenses side of the equation, but we can only lower our expenses so much. And there's only so much fun in living a life of austerity. The only people that seem to enjoy it are, are monks or people that are in the lean fire movement. What, what you're advocating aligns with what, what I tend to advocate, which is the number one way to reach the financial independence is to just increase your earnings because there is effectively no cap on how much money we can make. Now, that's obviously a little bit outside of the, the book, but do you, right. you want to share, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll bring it back on course, some of the ways that you've looked at in your life of, well, how do I increase the value of one hour of Bill Perkins' time? Yeah. What are my methods for developing rare skills, habits that make me more valuable than the average person is? I, I think, you know, across all industries, I tell, I tell people this, they're like, oh, I, you know, how to make my asses. Whether you're a shoe laster in the garbage business and the pizza business, there's a millionaire in every single vertical, every single one of them, there's a millionaire. And so what it really turns down to, at least my finding is that leverage being yes. good at something and finding leverage. So how do you lever your time? Right. And so there, there are two, you know, people do it all kinds of ways, right? Oh, they levered up and they became, instead of being a pizza parlor, they became pizza hut. Right. And so, you know, there's all types of books about there about working on your business, not in your business and, and, and leveraging yourself up. But the way I went about it is there's two areas where there's inherent leverage real estate and and trading commodities trading it, you know you put down a 10% of the commodity value as a good faith deposit right so it comes with this leverage and so a small change in the value of the commodity results in outsized percentage changes and gains right and so and the same thing is in leverage and and um why real estate is so popular amongst people to get get wealthy it's one of the Few areas where the average person can get extreme leverage. Yeah. You know, sometimes people use their first time home buyer plus the 5% plus the match to have like 20 to one leverage on a house, rent it out, and then just keep rolling that leverage, right? And then the next thing you know, they have 10, 20, 30, 40 rental properties, you know, some good cash flow, and they're doing, a, and they're leveraging their experience and then putting out a video or a course, right? And they're re leveraging themselves instead of teaching one class. Right. Where they can fit 30 people. They're like, I can teach the whole world, you know, and go on the Internet and using that leverage. Right. And so being good at something, being right and levering uh, works well to to get wealthy. And, and you know, leverage works horribly in reverse. Right. When you're wrong, you go bust up. Right. But yes, here's the thing. Like, it's asymmetric. That's you right. don't die when you go busto. You get a job, right? And you go and you swing the bat again, right? You get a job and it sucks and maybe your ego is bruised, but you know, you build up your, your cushion and you get to go at bat in the leverage game, right? But the rewards are, are ludicrous. They're unlimited, right? You can become a multi, multi, multi billionaire, right? In, the, in playing the leverage game. And so I, you know, for people who, you know, their, their concept of enough is, is a, a, a very large lifestyle, a very expensive lifestyle. 
I always recommend the, the, you know, find the leverage in your business and your vertical that you can be good at. The and for the listeners who don't necessarily understand a asymmetrical upside, what we're talking about is is the value to the upside is significantly larger than the pain of the downside. And and so using your example, Bill, even looking at becoming a, a content creator, my goal over the next right. let's say three to five years is to do this full time. Right. And everyone will tell you why that won't work, what the right. risks are. And finally, the realization that my wife understood where we were going with this when she responded to them and said, well, the worst that happens is he becomes a CFO again. Yeah, right. He's already a CFO. He's been doing this for 23 years. It's not as if he's unemployable. So, so people need to realize when you, when you take bets on yourself, there's always a fallback. There's always – you just go back to doing what you already were doing. But but let's rewind now. Let's go back in the book because there's a couple concepts that you talk about that I think drive a lot of the conversation throughout the book and throughout our conversation that it will be good for our listeners, or listeners to have. And one of them I think fell a little bit out of the Vicky Robbins book based on what you were saying. And they are both very engineering. The first one is your optimization problem, which is you want to maximize fulfillment – while Correct. minimizing waste. The second one is, and this one is big because I'm realizing where I make some mistakes in my life based on what you're saying here, is although we all have potential to make more money in the future, we can't go back and recapture time that's gone. So squandering our lives should be the greater worry. Can yeah. you tackle right. each of those concepts and, and which I think drive the whole conversation we're about to have? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the first one. Uh, it, it's it, I think it's easier. Like we're, we're we're trying to optimize we're trying to optimize our life, acquire positive experiences without being wasteful, right? And and I get I'll give you an example, a personal example. I go on trips. Travel is one of the things that fulfills me. So I, I think it's one of the things that you spend money on, and you actually are richer for spending the money and taking the trip. But I, I do it in a way that is no matter where I go, beautiful vista, taking a boat ride, and the. Italy, there's somebody doing it for one one hundredth the price, and they're having ninety five percent the same fulfillment, right? And so I'm pretty wasteful, right? Because I'm a bougie guy now, and I'm just <laughs> you know, out of comfort. And you know what we're trying to do is like optimize and understand the things that fulfill us, right? The discoveries that you know, the random what we're going to do without w being wasteful, right? Without just lighting money on fire, right? And so, and I, I think that's a fairly easy concept to get. Like you should be taking a trip. There's ways to do every single trip I've done for one one hundredth the cost. And everywhere I go, there's some student backpacker, right? Now you're maybe not going to be a backpacker, stay in a youth hostel, do the super saver. But in between that, in between myself and gap year student backpacking, right? There there's I'm just using the trip example. There's a place for people, right? To not be wasteful. Right. But if I, let's say you get so much fulfillment out of the bougie experience but then it's not wasteful. Mm. Your, 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 your money is a tool to fulfill your life, not the other way around. And so you have to be deeply in touch with what actually fulfills you and what is just fluff, right? And that that's a whole sub-segment. People are like, well, how do you know that? And that, that's a whole, they've written books on this, right? Like, how do you, you know, unplug and figure out what really fulfills you? But once you know that, then let's go optimize for that fulfillment, Right. And, and I don't tell people how to live. It could be playing chess or checkers or traveling or not traveling or, you know, eating pizza, I, whatever it is. I'm like, this is how we optimize, right? The but second you, part. But, but you do point out before we jump to the second part, because you had a friend who was a good example, the hedge fund guy who said, well, I get, I get enjoyment out of life out of not doing any of these things that you're talking about. And one of your points to him was, well, wait a second. You have enough money to test whether that's true. You don't Correct. actually know – whether you're going to love X, Y, or Z because right. you haven't done any of them because you've been right. so consumed by work. Right. So there is a little bit of a, hey, at, at least test your boundaries. At least try things before you say this is what you love. Well, part of the optimization is discovery, right? You don't come yes. out of the womb knowing what you want. You discover what you want, right? Like you, we, yeah. we have these organic spacesuits, right? I, you know, these our bodies, right? In which we process energy that allow us to explore our world, right? Ben space time, actually. So we are out there exploring, we are, are, are humans exploring this, this universe, right, that we're in. And as we explore this universe, and we interact with 
other beings exploring this universe and, and situations and places, we discover what we like. You do not come out of the womb going, I hate onions. I like chocolate. Uh, you know, I like to travel. I love Prague. I don't like this city. You know, I'm using myself as an example. I discovered that. Right. And so I realized that obviously I have not discovered the entire planet and I have not done all things and it will not be possible. So it's a lot of my fulfillment, my future fulfillment will come from experiments, discoveries, random events. And I have to plan for that as well. Yes. And so in encouraging people to have that discovery and sorry, I distracted you as you were going into, uh, as you were going into the, the second the one, second which is, 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 is the, the time squandering being the oh, yeah. more important than yeah. the money. You know, my greatest fear is wasting my life. It is, I get one ride. We're here on vacation on planet earth and the vacation ends. And so just as you would go on a trip to, I don't know, Italy or Europe or who knows, Chicago, that week, you don't want to waste your vacation, right? You, you, you spent your time, you got your ticket, you got your hotel, you're going to go see the sites, do the thing and do the Chicago thing, whatever that means to you or the Italy thing, whatever that means to you. Well, I'm here on planet Earth and I have limited time and I do not want to squander that. And so, you know, some of that came from looking at other people's lives. And so my father used to say, you can learn the hard way, which is learning from your own mistakes. You can learn the easy way, which is learning from other people's mistakes, or you can never learn. And he said, just don't be in the third bucket, right? Wow. But with respect to your life, okay, I don't get to go backwards in time. I can't learn from my own mistakes. I don't get my 40s back or my 30s back. And so one of the things I did, I was like, wow, I have to, I have to really learn the easy way. I have to learn from other people's mistakes. So there's a bunch of books and a lot of articles written about interviews with people who are 100, 90 years old, et cetera. And they, and they, they speak on their regrets. And I would say, by and large, every single regret has to do with something they did not do, not something they did, and a risk they did not take. Not I took too much risk or I did this or I said I love you first or I took a risk on this job or whatever. There's none of that. But there are. I had a chance to go move away or whatever, but I was too scared or whatever and I didn't do it and I regret this. I didn't take this chance or I didn't whatever or I or some regret related to not being kind or forgiving. Th those are basically the regrets in, in these uh, centenarians that they interview or people in their 90s took that to heart, right? Because I don't want to waste this one ride. I only get one vacation here. <laughs> so I, I don't want to waste my vacation. And I, not only that, my body and the state of my physical health and my ability to enjoy this vacation changes with time. There's this forcing function of doing activities at certain times of your life because yeah. of the natural decay of our bodies, right? We, we reach a uh, mental uh, peak at 28 and physical peak at 33. And from there, we're in plateau and decline. And so certain activities are, you get more fulfillment or more ability to do them at certain periods in your life. And because life has many dynamic decisions, not static decisions. And so let me just define what those are. A static decision would be, in my, in my definition would be, what do you had water or tea this morning? It doesn't affect anything down the line. A dynamic decision would be you had kids. It affects hundreds and thousands of decisions later on in life. Where you go, where you live, whether you come home from a vacation or not, you know, whether you come <laughs> home from dinner, like decisions that you never knew you were making at that time. But, you know, in the, in the totality, you know that I'm flipping a switch that is changing se several decisions down the line. Getting married is a dynamic decision. But the biggest one, I think, is having kids. So there's, there's, there's dynamic decisions and there's static decisions. And because life is like Tetris, in order to get the high score, you got to get the order right, I tell people. Right? If, you, if you're like, hey, you're in heaven and you're like, God goes, um, here are the bucket of experiences you can have on your vacation on planet Earth. You have 84 years, you know. And you go, I want to, I want to do this and I want to go to a strip club and I want to go dancing and I want to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro and I want to have kids and I want to get a degree and I want to start a business and then I want to blah, 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 you know, and you throw them all in there, right? All the numbers and everything. God goes, perfect. You can have them all. You just got to get the order right. 
And so the guy goes, hey, I, I want to get married and have kids. But he, you know, his strip club partying days came after his marriage. He didn't get that order right. That it's doesn't end work. well. Yeah. Work, right? The guy says, oh, I'm going to go uh, hella skiing in Mount Kilimanjaro at 80, 82. Doesn't, doesn't work right. Right. His body doesn't work right. He, he, he got the order wrong. Right. And so he can't fit all those activities. He can't get the fulfillment high score that he outlined for himself while he was in heaven because he didn't get the order right. And so I, I think, you know, I know we're wondering a little bit, but the, in the concept of the book, when you're thinking about like the things you want out of life, the when is extremely important, extremely important, not only just from an ability to do it, but also your enjoyment. Like if, if you're like, hey, we're going to go to a club, we're going to rave all night, and we're going to do glow sticks, I, I'm like, I, that doesn't really, doesn't do it for me. 20 something years ago, I'd be like, let's go, you know, let's go, you know, I'm up all night. I got the energy, right. But even though I could do it, I just don't have the, the, the attitude or, or the liking to do it. So certain things fall out of flavor, you know? It, and, and so when you look at that, it, yeah. it sounds, Bill, like a lot of this is the concept. A lot of people write about regret minimization frameworks, if you will. And so yes. a, a lot of what we're talking about is minimizing our future regrets and one of the ways you you talked about doing it as I think about it is the idea of the time buckets. Correct. And, and so can you, you bring the listeners up to speed? It, it, it is a lot of what you were just talking about, which is right. what do I want to do? What order do I want to do it? But you had a very visual way of doing that across a timeline of our life. Right. So we think about, hey, in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, in my 50s, what am I going to want to be doing? And how do I make sure that I live life in a way that allows me to do it? Which and now we're brings you to that tangent of the three pronged approach of time, money, age, and right. making sure or our health, sorry, right. and optimizing those to be able to do the time buckets when we get there. Right. So I'm so, going to throw that at you and see where we come up with. Yeah, yeah. So the the whole book, the method models, is basically a counterfactual regret minimization algorithm which solves for net fulfillment. So like just the broad strokes, right? If I can go technical or jargony, <laughs> right? There are three variables, your wealth, your health, and your time. And what we're trying to maximize for is net fulfillment. And so these mental models are basically what if, what if, what if, what if tree, right? To do counterfactual regret minimization to solve for max fulfillment. So when you play a chess computer, it's a counterfactual regret minimization algorithm to solve for checkmate, right? Not lose the game, right? I'm not solving for maximum health. I'm not solving for maximum wealth, not even maximum time. I'm solving for maximum fulfillment. And I'm, I'm using these variables and I'm looking how they change throughout time to keep, you know, getting that high fulfillment score. So one of those things is you have to know, right? In order to do this, like what fulfills you, what activities fulfill you and what order do they belong? Right. So instead of having a bucket list where it's like, before I die, I'm going to do all these things. Right. And people think it's like the movie, the bucket list, like, yo, you're going to die in two, you know, a year. OK, let me run around the globe and do the things I always wanted to do. It doesn't work that way. That won't be the most fulfilling thing. I, I'd say from now to the grave, let's do five year increments. When it gets later, further out, you can do 10 year increments because it's pretty hard to predict. Right. There's going to be a lot of things that you're going to discover that are going to show them the book uh, in those time buckets. We have a one bucket. So let's say you're 30 to 35, 35 to 40, 40 to 45. What experiences and activities that you want to happen that belong there, right? That, that are going to fulfill you. And you, you can break them out into like, uh, they could be intellectual learning, spiritual health, vacation, career, uh, you know, emotional, it could be anything, right? It could be all these lessons. You can say, well, I want to get married. I think I want to have my second kids. I want to see my granddaughter, you know, my daughters go to school. I want to go to Jamaica. I would like to complete this. I want to get my PhD. Then you just keep going each period. In this period, this is, these are the things. You're not going to know everything, right? This is something you're going to keep revisiting over time, right? Because a CFRM is always recursive. It just keeps going, right? Like when the computer, it makes a move, then you make another move. Whoop. We got another, we got another algo, right? So as time goes on, you're going to keep 
visiting this and updating it as you discover things and uh, as things happen and as you discover things in, in the world, right? And so by doing that, you get an idea of one, what your capital needs are. Some of these things will be free. Like I want to call my mother X amount of times. I want to say I love you to my wife X amount of times, right? Like some of these things will be free and some of these things will be expensive. I want to, you know, go to France and bike the Tour de France route, right? Or I want to, I want to go to Africa or I want to do a charity mission or et cetera, right? And so, and then as you do it, you start to say, wait a minute, that doesn't fit here, right? This mm. belongs here. Wait, why do I have this activity further out in life when my health is poor, when I would really rather enjoy this now, right? And have that. And so I've done that myself. You know, one of the things I discovered that I didn't think I would like was training. And then what I mean is riding on a train. And so oh, I, went on, okay. I went on an Orient Express trip as my travel agent who, who tries to find interesting things that I might do. And I was like, I don't want on a train. I hate riding a suit. There's going to be a bunch of strangers and you have to get dressed up to go in the bar car. This is going to be terrible, but whatever, I'm going to go. I, so I reluctantly go and fight two friends and I fucking loved it. <laughs> loved it. I had the best time. I didn't mind the suit. You get to see things that you cannot see because there's no roads and the planes don't fly low enough. And there's all these towns. It's beautiful. It's relaxing. It was amazing. I would, I raved about it. I thought, oh my gosh, I want to do this. And then there's all these other trains, et cetera. And so my wife and I, that's how my fiance, we're like, oh, we should do this Peru. And then there's a whole train society. There's the Rovios in South Africa. You can take the train across Canada. And there's just, this, this is a thing. I didn't even know it was a thing. And there's this seven star prefecture train that goes through Japan that I have a seven prefecture train that goes to Japan. It's a five-star train. I'm like, we have to do this. We have to do this. But one of the things we did, we're like, hey, we're going to do this Peru trip. We, we had a vacation coming up. We're like, we're going to take the train in Peru and it's going to go up and then it's going to Machu Picchu and then we'll go to Machu Picchu and we'll we'll do this. And Lara goes to me, he goes, we can train, meaning we can ride these trains till you're in your 80s, 70s. Yes. Shouldn't we be taking... This trip that has more physical demands that, you know, we're going to be walking to cities and we're going to be wake surfing and blah, blah, blah. The things, the other things that fulfill me and push the train trip further forward in life. And I was like, you're right. So we rearranged our, you know what I mean? We rearranged it. So I'm going to get the most fulfillment because if I don't do the, the more physically demanding trip now, I can't do it later in my 80s, right? So I get more of both just by rearranging the order, Right. And so that's what, what uh, uh, time bucketing your life does. It also allows you to make decisions like, hey, I'm saving money. I'm earning this return. And I'm going to dip into the memory dividends. Is it better to take two trips 10 years from now, two ski trips 10 years from now, or one ski trip now and have the associated memory dividends and conversation and adventure, et cetera, than saving and having two ski trips 10 years later in life? And depending on how old you are, that answer may be different, right? If I'm, if I'm 65, it's one ski trip now, not two. I'm like, now my knees can't even get that many runs in. But if I'm 20, it might be, you know, maybe I'll save it and take two ski trips later. I'll have my stuff together. The women will like me better. I can, you know what I mean? Like, I'll be more mature. I'll be able to handle it. Like, who knows? Who knows your reasons or your logic? Your reasons will be your reasons and my reasons will be my reasons. But it helps you figure out, should I be... Uh, having delayed gratification or should I be having gratification now? Is, is pushing gratification further into the future actually less gratification or no gratification? Oh, th so there's three things I want to tackle in there with you. There's so much, Bill. So the the first one, and, and you didn't necessarily talk about this in the book, but I believe, I, I believe I've heard it on another podcast. So when, when you were speaking in there, you talked about, for example, you have mental improvement, emotional, spiritual, physical, financial – and often we can get too caught up in only one of those. So for example, looking at you on the Zoom call, this will only be audio, but you're a physically fit guy. You've done well financially, but you've also balanced that with your love of travel and enjoying experiences. Whereas some people seem to own, they want to be the most fit triathlete or the most financially wealthy person and they focus only in one bucket. How do you use these concepts of net fulfillment to say, well, wait a second, 
don't optimize 100% in one. Use the Pareto principle as an example and, and get the 80% by putting X effort in right. to each bucket. How do you look at that? I mean, for me, I'm like, what? how does this affect my net fulfillment? Like that every variable is a tool to get net fulfillment. And I have, and I'm, you know, there's no set formula. Each one I have to think about it deeply. Like, okay, I can be in better shape than I am. I can be 7.9 body fat, you know, X, Y, Z. But then I look at the time to put in that. And I'm like, wouldn't that be better just taking a nice walk with my kid? Do I want to be in the gym or, or do I want to be four hours a day or, you know, to be in the best shape, like David Goggins style, right? I'm like, versus would that time be more fulfilling? And will I look back in the future had I spent it with my loved ones or doing X, Y, and Z activity? And then I also look as the incremental dollar, you know, particularly with money. Uh, this is how I do it. I tell my friends, it's okay to work, but what are you working for? Mm. I always attach every dollar to something I am working for. If I, if I can't identify what I'm working for, then I'll quit or I'll work less, right? I, I tend to work less, right? So I, I, I know there's people that making up numbers, they really don't know what they're working for. But if you ask the question, they'll start making stuff up, right? <laughs> but, but like I identify, it's like, okay, I'm working to survive. Okay, I got my survival. I'm surviving. Okay, what experience? I'm working to put my kids through college. I'm working, you know, to maintain this level of, of lifestyle and the house and the whatever. I'm working because I want to go on these trips. I'm working because I want this thing that I can't afford yet, right? So I'm, I'm working for that. I'm working for this charity that I want, you know, but I have to tie that to something, right? And, I have to tie, and then once I've tied it to something, then I can go, okay, do I really want it? Does that really fulfill me? Am I giving up hours mm. of my life where I can do something fulfilling for a thing in the future that, eh. and I, I recently, um, there was a thing that I thought I wanted. I, I rented it. Uh, and I was like, no, I don't really want to work for this thing. And it was, it was kind of a relief. It's like, I don't have to make the money for this thing. It does not fulfill me. I, I'm wasting my time. I should be. I could e either a allocate the money I have to other things that fulfill me or donate them to charity or, or which is another form of fulfillment. It's another form of consumption or not work, you know, and just use the time to, you know, goof off, meditate, explore, read books, you know, allocate my time more effectively. And so as I allocate my hours here on life and, and part of it is to acquire capital to, to, to get the things that fulfill me. If, if I'm working for no fulfillment, that's, that's a no, no right away. Absolute no, no. And so then we get into this debate argument is that which I get into with a lot of my friends who have been habituated about work. They're like, but work itself fulfills me. And so, you know, and I get it, I get into this, uh, uh, I don't know for, of the successful people, this is kind of like that, uh, heroin addict conversation that I have on them all the time. I'm like, look, I understand it. You're on heroin and you're fine. And I have a problem with your heroin addiction. You don't have a fun. Um, you're having fun, or at least you think you're having fun. Right. And so because I love them and they're close to my, they're my close friends, you know, I, I call bullshit on them. I think you have been habituated to this work. The other muscles, the, the fulfillment muscles of whatever they be, whether it be travel or reading books or interacting with friends or going to the dinner, those have atrophied. And this work is destroying your life. So like a heroin addict is happy, but he's destroying his life. All the other parts of his life are falling apart in, in exchange for the heroin, right? And so what I have to do through this long argument and debate and, and insults and whatever, is that you are similar to a heroin addict. These habits that you have formed to be good at your job have consumed you and atrophied every single other part of your life. And it's continuing and you're wasting your life mm. because we are very good at taking complex things and shifting them into default mode network, right? And the habit of work, right? Like we're very good at that. Like driving a car is pretty complex. Like you got a signal, you got to do this and you whatever, but eventually it just goes into default mode network. You know, you're driving one hand, you're doing this, you're turning the radio on. You don't even know how you got home. You just auto signal, you auto turn. You, 
And the same thing goes with more complex tasks, like guys who are accountants or lawyers or CFA. It just goes into default mode network. You know how to do the thing. You're doing the thing and you're just doing it. You're an autopilot. It drags you completely into this zombie state of productivity for no reward. Well, it, go it goes even beyond that, Bill, right? Because we're, we are creatures of justification. And we're wired to justify whatever it is that we do. So if you say to me, hey, you don't like work. If I agree with you, then I have to now go through a reconciliation process of, well, wait a second. Why do I go into this building for 60 to 70 hours a week and give – what am I giving up my life for? I right. have to like it. If I don't like it, then, then I'm making a mistake, and I can't be making a mistake because I'm a smart, intelligent human, so I have to love what I'm doing. And I'm just going to keep saying it even if Bill has strong arguments to the contrary. I'm going to say I love it because that justifies what I do with 60 to 70 hours a week. I'm, I'm assuming for your friends, they're not working 35 to 40 hours. These, these are people who are working all out, long hours – long weeks. Yeah. And, and so they're using it as a, as a means to justify what they're spending their time on. Yeah, it's good. And, and, and actually, I have to deconstruct it even further because there are elements of work that are enjoyable, but yes. are replaceable and better outside of work. So a lot of people, like when you go to work, right, your whole life revolves around work, where you eat, who you socialize with, where you eat lunch and the places you like around it, the neighborhood you're familiar with, the who you socialize with, et cetera, right? When the pandemic help happened, people got to know their neighbors and socialize in different ways and et cetera, right? They broke those habits. A lot of people are like, holy shit, I don't need work for this, right? So people not only become dependent on work because of the habit they form to be the rat and the cheese and the justification of that, but all their life, their social life and other things that they enjoy have become dependent on work. Now, you know, I've, I've had this discussion with someone who says, but I like the people. And I was like, you can quit work and take those people on vacation and you see even more. There's no, there's nothing stopping you from interacting with those people many hours, right? Not with your, you know, occasionally buried in the screen and the occasional whatever. Like you can take them out to dinner. You can take them out on trips. You can meet them all the time, right? Like you don't have to do that, right? It's and, – and, and other things. Well, I like the mental stimulation. I'm like, you want some mental stimulation? The world has lots of puzzles. That you can stop, solve, right? That you can apply yourself, et cetera, right? But this is what they've been doing and this is the habit and it's hard to break those habits. And so, you know, a lot of these conversations are not just, hey, a lot of the conversation is identifying what muscles they atrophy, your social muscle. You don't know how to meet anybody unless it comes to work. You don't know how to pick a restaurant unless it's, you know what I mean? Like eat a lunch unless it's around work. Like, or, you know, I'm saying, you don't, you know, where you drive, the route you drive is, you know, all these things, right? Like you don't know your neighbors. You don't know, you don't know how to solve any other puzzle because you haven't been solving other puzzles. You just don't even attempt because you're so obsessed with the work puzzle, right? You can apply your difference engine, your, your AI carbon based supercomputer to all these other puzzles. That will you can have a massive impact on, or just for fun, just because learning is fun, right? And so that's a long conversation that I've had with people, just kind of like, oh, you know, it takes a while to go, oh, yeah, you get it, you get it. And then, the, you know, habits are hard to break, right? And so I've had them, and it, it has taken time for people to kind of break away, like, yeah, I need to start. They have started breaking away. They have started exploring and building up those other muscles, Right. Those other social muscles, those other puzzles to solve, those other the adventure muscle, the travel muscle. Right. Like nobody at 17 or 21 was like, hey, this is what I want to be doing. You know, I want to be in a room for 60 hours, like really <laughs> getting to the nitty gritty of the thing to make a dollar to never spend it. Like nobody was thinking that in the beginning. Right. Yeah. But at the beginning, the dollars had a purpose. Somehow in the middle, the dollars have no purpose except for themselves. Oh. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy what you're hearing so far and want me to be able to get your favorite guests on this show, please do me a quick favor. Subscribe to the show and leave me a rating. The 30 seconds of your time will mean a ton to me. 
So one of the things you talk about with these people, I'm assuming, and in, in you brought up earlier, is this idea of investing in the experiences themselves. And, and then you mentioned it, but we didn't dive into it, was the concept of memory dividends. Can, can you share what you mean by that? Because that yeah. really starts to unfold and compound yeah. Yeah. over our life. I thought that was a beautiful uh, example yeah. that you gave. So when you have an experience, there's the, the consumption of experience itself, right? You go on a first date and you, you go to the movies, right? And you have a first kiss. I'm just using this example. And that, and that was great and it was enjoyable. But you also, and you get fulfillment from that. But you also get fulfillment for every time we recall that experience and discuss it. You tell the story. How did you meet? Oh, we met and, you know, we bumped into each other on the train station. He knocked my, you know, coat, whatever. You tell the thing and he invited me to dinner, to take it out, whatever. And we had a whatever and kiss. And then, oh, that's a great story, whatever. And then, you know, you're getting fulfillment from that original experience. Every time, you know, later on you get married, like, remember when we first met, you know? And every time you recall that, you get a little bit of the joy and fulfillment of the original experience, right? Ask anybody who's at a game winning home run, uh, went to high school or any kind of event. And we also get memory dividends just in a mundane way. Like when you walk up to a door, you're never like, what is this thing protruding with a handle in that shape? You're like, oh, it's a door. You open the door and you're able to go through the door, right? That's part of the memory dividend, right? Just <laughs> having, having that functionality. And so, and that gives you fulfillment. So, cause you're able to go through doors. And so when we, you know, if the purpose of money is to have fulfillment, right? And you're, you're, you're attaching the money to drive your fulfillment. We have to consider that when we invest in an experience, the dividends that are paid out over time versus investing in, let's say, a money market in order to buy a future experience, what interest rate that will pay, right? Mm. It's the same thing, right? The purpose, the money is there to be consumed and drive your fulfillment. And so we're, have, we're, we're, we're solving for net fulfillment. And so when you save, what you're saying is, is that, the future consumption of an experience is greater than the current consumption plus the memory dividends. Okay. Right? <laughs> right? So that rate, you know, and so, you know, I entered this concept called your own personal interest rate, right? And so you have your, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm 25 years old. You know, my future consumption of these experiences and the market rate is, is greater than just having this one experience now. But as time goes on, the future consumption of experiences are not as valuable or not as fulfilling as the current consumption of experience plus the associated memory dividends. And memory dividends, they compound. They're actually radioactive, right? Like when you go to dinner with somebody and you have a conversation, most, a significant portion of the conversation of things that have happened and experiences you have had, right? If you ever get a group of friends together, I mean, how much do they talk about the old days or the thing that happened or we threw Tom in the water and remember this happened and the shark came and we barely survived, you know, whatever. I'm just making this up, right? Like remember in college or remember this. And, I, you know, some of my friends, I hear the same stories 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 times, you know, and each time a little bit, a little bit of enjoyment, a little bit of the memory dividend. And I'm like, wow, man, that, that, that trip, that experience really paid off. Like it's really kicking out dividends. Like what a great investment, right? I'm glad I didn't go, nah, let's not go do that and save that 10 years now. We'll do another trip, right? I'm glad that money is converted into that experience and those memory dividends because it's driving a metric fuck ton <laughs> of, of fulfillment, right? Of dividends and fulfillment, right? And so I'm like, what a great investment. And so, you know, one of the things I, I, I say in the book and I tell people is like, invest in it. Just like Warren Buffett says, you know, when's the time to invest? Invest early. Now, right? Invest early, invest early, invest early. I say invest in experiences and your fulfillment early in order to get the maximum out of the memory dividends. And, and, and I want to tie that to something you talked about early in the conversation, which was early in your career, actually, when you were excited that you'd saved a thousand bucks and your boss told you you were an idiot because you weren't using the concept of consumption smoothing, which is the exact opposite of almost anything you read in the in the fire world. Right? right, which is start saving early, save as much as you can, invest. And and he told you, well, wait a second, like Bill, eventually you're going to be making a million bucks a year. Like, why are you worried about a thousand dollars today when you're not living life? And and why this jumped out at me is I was that guy, right? I 
grew up grew up with no money started as an accountant started at 36 grand then it was 41 then it was 46 it just went up 20 percent a year every year for the last 21 years roughly and, but i never thought to say let's borrow from future clint to do cool shit today and so i didn't start traveling the world until i was probably mid 30s and right. and i and then i realized i love nothing more nor does my <laughs> wife who was with me on that entire journey right. so we we scrimped for 16 years and then realized we love nothing more than seeing cities throughout the world and now we want to do it the rest of our lives but we wasted 16 years and we could have just been consumption smoothing correct so so what is consumption smoothing and why <laughs> should a lot more young people be doing it oh yeah it, it's so it, 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 like you i think you said it perfectly is that you know you're gonna have times assuming you you, you know for, for most people their income is going to increase over time and so the mistake i was making and a lot of people make is we borrow from our poor selves to give to our future richer selves right that, that was saving, right? And what you want to try and do is equilibrate your income over the lifespan of your life in order to get the most out, out of it, right? I add in my book another adjustment, which is, you know, your health and your ability to consume experiences. So you're not completely equilibrating. So it's equal each year. You're like, hey, most of my consumption of, of experiences that cost money, if we just use the physical capability, our attitude, our lung capacity, et cetera is going to happen between, you know, our adult lives from 20 to say 55, right? And then it starts really tapering down. It, and it, and I, I throw out that number because, you know, I'm using American numbers. I mean, if you're, if you, it's your biological age, your health age, not your numerical age, right? Like some people are 30 who are really like 55, <laughs> you know, and some people are 55 who are really 40, you know, or 44. So what we're trying not to do is borrow from our poorer selves and give to our richer selves, right? We're trying to take money from our future richer selves and give to our poorer selves. And so that we can have the experiences that belong in our 20s, right? That are, don't necessarily transfer well into our 30s or 40s, right? And depending on who you are and what you like, that's going to be something different for everybody, right? Mm. Like I use the uh, wakeboarding. My last wakeboarding experience and for the rest of my life was when I was 50. Okay. Uh, because back and my, you know, injuries and, and just the speed at which you travel wakeboarding. Now I wake surf. And so I re recall sitting on a beach and my friends were like, we're going to go wakeboarding. It was on my 50th birthday. Uh, and I said, and eh, now I'm going to hang out here and loaf and, you know, do whatever. And then I thought, and I thought about it again. I said, wait a minute, if I don't go wakeboarding now in this setting, when am I ever going to go wakeboarding again, given the state status of my back and my age, et cetera. So I decided to get up and go wakeboarding one with them. And that was my last wakeboarding day. I actually got to jump the wake, <laughs> did a nice trick and that was it. And then now I live off the memory dividends associated and now I'm a wake surfer and that's it. But let's say that costs money. You know, there was money trips. Like if I didn't spend my wakeboarding dollars, then I'm never getting to spend them later. Right. And so when you're younger, when we're like consumption smoothing and you're in your twenties, there are certain activities that are best mit, fit in your 20s. Like, I don't know, traveling around Europe in a youth hostel and, and backpacking, et cetera, right? It, you, it's, it's, it's probably, for me, that would be better in my 20s and not in my 30s, right? And so I'm like, oh, I don't have the money. I don't want to spend the money. It's too tight. I don't want to do X, Y, and Z. Had I been smarter at that time, I would have been like, hey, why don't you borrow from your future richer self? Mm. <laughs> you know, why don't you borrow from your future rich yourself? Like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's borrow from that guy. What does he need? thousand dollars means nothing to that guy. Let's borrow from him, take the thousand and go make the trip, right? And that's kind of the idea, right? Just breaking it down simply. It's like there's this future richer guy that we can borrow from that makes our total life fulfillment, all of us happier. So, right? so I, I'm going to try to use that with using something you talked about earlier and, and see if we, we can walk through an example with you. 
So we have two boys, 14 and 11. And we have a cottage we go to in the summers. And when we're not there, we rent it out. So it, it's it's in good shape. I, I did the example your friend did. I get good enjoyment of it while I'm there and create those memories with our boys. And, and I make an argument with my wife. I think we should invest in a boat for when we're up there. And she says, well, that makes no sense. Why would we take on debt now for a boat? Only buy a boat if we have the cash for it. And then I think, but by the time that happens – the boys won't be there with us. They won't get that enjoyment. But I go back to your idea where you said you rented something to test out the theory. So should I say, hey, why don't we rent a boat for two weeks next time we're up there and just see what the experience is with the boys every day, the smiles on their faces, the memories we create. And then next year we make a decision on whether that is the right investment to create net fulfillment in our lives and the lives of our boys because it's it's only at this stage partially about us it's also got to be partially about them yeah i'm i'm so biased in this example it's crazy <laughs> I, I so i lived in st thomas and 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 um I, I always tell people get the boat one of the most fulfilling things i've ever done is buy the boat it is the ultimate memory maker social thing you're going to do most enjoyable memories i wouldn't trade those for anything and i've gotten so much enjoyment so let me try and remove my bias <laughs> out of there uh, <laughs> on the boat i i definitely think that's the correct thing to do is is you're like i'm trying to explore without being wasteful i'm going to rent and see does this produce the experiences that belong in this bucket that we want to have do we have enjoyment do we use it enough do x x y and z I tend to think you're going to rent the boat. You're going to have the absolute time of your life with your kids, irreplaceable moments that your future selves will be like, thank fucking God we got the boat. Excuse mm. my French. But oh, that's, my, that's me. I'm a biased guy, <laughs> you know, who experience. And, and every, uh, I will say that every person who's come to St. Thomas, I said, listen, islands are great. But when you have your own dinghy, even just a dinghy scooting around the islands, it completely changes the experience completely you, you it opens the world up your your exploration your fun your goofing off your social you know inviting friends on th that will produce uh memory dividends that are just outstanding that you would never you you would give up your right arm to never give those memories up right to to, to keep them and so I'm too biased, but I say you're doing the process of what you're doing what you're going about it I think that is correct. Right, you're tasting the cookie before you eat the whole cookie. <laughs> yeah. Le Leslie, when you're editing this, Bill is absolutely right. We should probably talk to Avine about the boat he wants to sell us and maybe <laughs> test run it for a summer at a, at a price. So, uh, factor this in while you're editing the show. My uh, wife edits, so oh, this, awesome. this, this will this 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 will be very very good for that. Uh, you're, you're basically for that conversation, Bill. You're like, hey, is this cookie worth an hour on the treadmill? You know, like you guys are like, well, we're going to have to work this. This takes this many hours of our life to make this money to get a boat. Do we really want to exchange it for this fulfillment? And I think when you test it, you'll come to the answer yes. But your process is 100 percent correct. Well, the the thing that jumps out at me, and there there's a couple graphs I've seen where they show our time with our children and how we get to the age of 19 and we've spent 95% of the time we will with them for the rest of our their lives already. And yeah. then the last 5% is 19 and above. And it, and it makes me think, well, my oldest is 14 and a half. I've only got four and a half years with this guy. Like I want those four and a half years to be the best four and a half years we can ever have. And I, and I know that can change if we have money because we can do annual family trips and things, right. but, but maximizing that time to 19. It's also like you're taking it one sided. Like you're also looking at it from a standpoint that your kid even wants to be around you. I mean, yeah. He's going to have a girlfriend and trips and buddies and his own adventure that he wants to go live. So it, you may have all the money in the world, but they got different, they have a, their own adventure that they want to live that probably does not include you. That's true. <laughs> you know? That's true. Uh, and so, and also you're, you're using the biggest term, like four and a half years. I would use the smaller terms. You have four summers. Oh, oh, 
dagger to the heart, Bill. I mean, <laughs> like yeah. I'm getting emotional now. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe maybe three. I don't know what year. You know what year is? Fourteen is freshman, right? So he's in grade nine, or in the Amer- America, we say the ninth yeah. grade. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you yeah, have, he's have, only got three summer, summers. Three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have three yeah. summers, and you know, some of that might be camp or with other friends or another trip. Like you have yeah. three, four trips like this left. You know, maybe there's yeah. other breaks, etc. So I would use the correct unit because you're like, oh, four and a half years. I'm like, yeah, that's three, three summers, three trips. You know, we talk about the, you know, we just talked about it. It's like, wow, we get two more spring breaks. What are daughters? And and you know, on these spring breaks, they want to interact with their friends. Like we, that's we get, right. We get yeah. like a day or two out of that spring break. So I get like, really, if you think about it, like I get six days, I get six yeah. days over the next X years related to spring break, summer, you know, it's like, I got to force them to be, you, you, you know, di- different kids are different with different families, but like, you know, they, they, they become their own independent person and mom and dad aren't that cool anymore. And their friends are, et cetera. And, you know, maybe your kids are attached at the hip and they, they want to hang out with you all the time. But, you know, uh, you know, the typical American experience is your kids don't want to know you at 15, you know, <laughs> it's like forced interaction. So like, if you can get something cool, like a boat, and get those experiences in, I'm like, for God's sakes, do not miss that opportunity, whatever it, it, you do. Okay, I'm sold. And that, <laughs> ties, and that ties to, to the next concept. Look, the next rule you have is the title of the book. And I have to admit, it scares the crap out of me. Growing up without much money, I've spent a lot of my time trying to amass a certain amount of wealth, and I have goals to like get that number to a certain point. But then you say, well, well, why? Like, you should be dying with zero, so you know that you didn't waste one iota. And the idea that I can outspend my net worth, which ties a bit to rule four as well, is it just scares me that it could run out, right? Which which is one of the biggest things that people raise with you right. about their fear on this journey. And you have this concept of the three R's, like how do I overcome that fear and, and get that willingness to let go of the, of the big nut or chest of wealth, Scrooge McDuck vault that I'm trying to build? Yeah, uh, I mean, well, the three R's are random people, random date and time, random amount in terms of leaving money to your kids. And I, I talk about the delivered giving to kids. But this fear, you know, fear is hard to overcome. What I try and do is mitigate that fears in the most efficient way. Right. And so a lot of people basically are trying to act as their own insurance agent by wasting their lives, accumulating capital and be like, okay, I'm insuring against X bad things and running out of money. Right. And, you know, I I try and say, well, let's think rationally about it. Like how much you're going to spend? What are the experiences you want to have? If you're worried about running them out of money, let's buy an annuity. Let's think of the insurance product that's out there that's better than you being your own insurance agent. So for every risk that's out there, generally there's an insurance product, right? There's long-term care insurance. People are like, what if I you know, could need help or whatever? I was like, it's actually very cheap. If you buy long-term care insurance, you're 20, 30, 40, it's very cheap, okay? Much cheaper than you trying to, than you wasting your life, Okay. If you're worried about outliving, like what if I live to 110? You can buy an annuity. It's much cheaper than you wasting your life, right? The the mark, the edge, you know, they're making 6% or 5%. Like, it's nothing compared to you who are, you know, not an actuarial, don't have the law of large numbers, don't have a whole bunch of customers and all these, whatever. The edge they're extracting from that product is teeny relative to you wasting your life and not renting a boat and going with your kids. Right. And having that fulfillment moment. Right. And so what what I try and do is, you know, because fear, I'm not going to tell people, I'm never going to convince people not to be afraid. But what I can do is help them mitigate the fear in the most optimal way. Right. I, I can't take people and like I did with my daughters, they're like they could swim, but they were scared to swim in the deep end. I was like, why? You're still going to swim. Well, it's a deep. Well, you're still be on the top of water. You can still swim. No amount of logic was going to get them over their fear until I just throw them in the deep end and they start swimming around and they're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, or I was with them and they were swimming, holding on to my neck. I was the insurance agent of yeah. the deep end, even though they didn't need me and they'd be holding on to my neck in the deep end. I was the insurance agent. Right. And so, you know, I offer, I look at, okay, what is your exact fear? Let's identify it. Oh, you're afraid of outliving your money. Okay. Well, there's an insurance product called an annuity. We can, we can do that. How much would you like to purchase in order to 
mitigate this risk. Or I'm worried about long-term health and my nurse or whatever. There's a thing called long-term care insurance. A lot of people offer these products. It's well-regulated. We can dig into them, spend some time on it. And the time you spend on digging into these products and, and buying the long-term care insurance will be much better than you wasting your life trying to act as your insurance agent for long-term care insurance. As a matter of fact, you're probably ill-suited because if the prices explode, you're out of money anyway, and the insurance company can withstand that hit. So you're not even, you know, a stable insurance agent, right? And so this is the way I go about addressing fears, right? Like the fears are largely irrational, right? Sometimes rooted in something that could happen, but is overblown. And so I look to the products and the market or ways they can mitigate that fear that minimizes them wasting their life. So, mm -hmm. you know, my goal is for you to minimize you wasting your life. So we go through a process of like, how, how can we do that? How can we do that? How can we not, how can we not mess up this one ride you have, this one vacation? I think probably your listeners at most 60 year vacation, you know, 25, 85. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and really we're being generous. If you look at life expectancy in the U S right. It's not, it's, it's not, it's declining. It's going, I mean, it, it, it scares it, it, me a little. Up, it, you know, people, people are not as healthy as they should be. We, we, we tend to overeat. I mean, everybody can go and I recommend they actually figure out what their expected life, uh, life, life outcome is because knowing having a good range in the end, it helps you plan better and helps you get the most out of your life. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a vacation, I go, you're on vacation, but it's a random number. You don't really optimize your vacation. Like, do I have a day? Or if you have two days left or, 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 or 10 day vacation or, or, you know, a 10 month vacation, what you do each day is different, right? How, how, how you allocate your time is different with what, what the things you do, how you prioritize things are different. And so knowing when your expiration date is uh, as close as possible here on planet earth will help you optimize your vacation here on earth and get the most out of it. And I, and I haven't done it, but I love the idea. I've seen the visual a few times when people get the poster with the number of weeks. I have that. And, and then they gray out, well, what's already happened? So how many yeah. weeks do I have left in my life? Yeah. It's a little scary when you look at it that way, Bill, but it gives you perspective on, hey, how should you be optimizing these weeks? Yeah, I have, I have that. I think about these, you know, quantifying these things is sometimes scary for people because particularly in Western culture, death isn't talked about. People just kind of, it's this far off thing that's just going to happen to me or getting old or decaying is this far off thing. And anybody who's 40 will tell you, no, it's not this far off thing. I can feel it. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, know yeah. The oh yeah, absolutely. They know the difference. It's coming, right? And so that to me is freeing and liberating and gives me permission to be me and be fulfilling and not care, right? Like to lose my ego and care about what other people think or about what I say and be like, no, I only get one ride. I, I, I'm going to do what I want to do, right? Like if, yeah. you know those, those movies where everybody's on a plane and it's about the crash. They're, they're, they're doing, you know, it's kind of comical. They're like, I love you and blah, blah, blah. And they're confessing their sins and doing whatever they want to do because it's their last moments, right? Like in a, in a, in a tiny bit of way, like knowing your death date and, and being viscerally aware of it and the weeks going by is kind of liberating. It liberates you to be yourself and really get you in touch with what are your priorities? What do you really want out of life? And by going through that process, right? Like we talk about the big death. Right. I, I want to go back to that little death. Right. Yes. There is a, the, the, the death. There's lots of little deaths in your life. And for you, the one we just talked about, there's going to be the death of you with kids in the house, with oh. young kids. Right. And that's coming. And it's four years away. And you have four summers. Right. X spring breaks. Blah, you know, four Christmases, you know, whatever, if, if you're lucky, because they might say, no, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the summer with my friends this trip, you know, whatever, right? That wakes you up and you're like, shit, I got to make the most out of these four summers. I'm going to rent the boat. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to do my best to make the most out of this period. And then there's, you know, that happened to you with the young kids and that's going to be with you. You were CFA and now I'm the podcast you and then the future, you know, you have all these little deaths, right? These periods come and go. And then there's the big death. Like there is no, no future experiences here on planet earth. And so realizing that that's what time bucketing does is like realizing, like I need to maximize and make the most of this segment 
right? Like kind of calculus. We're going to calculus, like the integral, right? Like I need to make the most of this time period. And these are the experiences that belong here. And I have two kids that actually kind of want to hang out with me still, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> or, or at least a little bit, you know, and I get to go on vacation. They have to go with me, you know, with them. And I get to spend time and enjoy them at this time period in life. Like that wakes you up and you are going to do your best to make the most of it. And just as that happens in the little deaths, even with the big death, like I have this period left and these, I'm going to do my best to get the most fulfillment out of it. And I think that wakes people up out of autopilot, out of just, hey, I'm just going to maximize for wealth. I'm going to throw my life away to maximize for the biggest number, which a lot of people do. And a lot of what we're talking about is that right there. We're trying to get people off autopilot and to live their life with intention. In, in one of the ways you talked about the little deaths is, is this idea that people should reflect on there's a last time for everything. Correct. The last time. And so the more they can think of the concept of the last time I'll have with my kid in high school, the last time I'll be able to wakeboard, right. the last time I'll be physically fit. So that that was a beautiful way to think about it. And then even – we talked about Western philosophy, but when we go to Eastern, you go to Stoicism, you go to Buddhism, a lot of that is meditating on the fact that, remember, I must die or I will yeah. die, which I tattooed onto myself because it's this concept – like we are all going to die. We are all impermanent until they figure out how to stick us into a computer. Or right. we, we, we get to that stage, and that might happen in our lifetime. Well, it, Who knows? It, it, and even if, it, even if that was there, it would be a different time bucket. Right? It would yes. be like the, the human you that wasn't in a computer. Now we go on to this, you know, like, you know, this book is about optimizing your life for net fulfillment. And you need to like break these down into discrete periods that match your decay, right? That, that, that kind of, kind of, you can get the most out of it. Now, some people that might be a two year period or three year period, it, it doesn't matter. As long as you're off autopilot and thinking about it, you're not in default mode network. You're already optimizing your life. Like a lot of people, they won't, I have a lot of concepts in the book, right? That help you, you know, mental models that help you minimize waste and optimize your life. And some people will reject it. I don't care. I'm not dying with zero. I'm, I'm going to die with a million dollars in the bank or whatever. I'm, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to give money to my kids at between 28 and 33. I'm going to wait till I die, which is suboptimal. But if you're just thinking about it, being intentional about it, you're already optimizing your life. You've already... I'm already saving a little bit of your life. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, and so this – throw a last one out at you. It'll be a little bit of a longer one because it, it's really emotional for me. And and then we'll uh, fire the final four at you. So you talk about in the book the idea of the cats in the cradle, which for a lot of dads is such an emotional song. And it reminds me I was I was – my oldest was about eight or nine years old. Stop looking me in the eye. Stop saying I love you. You know, we said I love you to each other every single night of his life up until then. And it wasn't until I said to him, hey, I've been noticing, you know, you're not looking at me. You're not saying I love you. Is this because I work too much? And he said, yeah, like you're not here. And it, it, up until that age, as a father, you're their hero just for being their father. But then all of a sudden they hit an age where you're only their hero – if you're in their life and I'd been sacrificing wealth accumulation and desire ahead of my, ahead of my kids. And you talk about in the book, you say, I do believe firmly your real legacy for your kids consists of the experiences you've shared with your children, especially when they're growing up, the lessons and other memories you've imparted to them of all the experiences you were trying to bequeath to your child. One of those experiences is time with you. So that resonated because of the past and also one of the goals I have is to become a solopreneur and to spend the last years of their high school with them. Can, can we talk about your experience with your kids and why you think this one is so important to the people that are listening who are parents and who are chasing possibly the wrong things when their children aren't getting the full benefit of them? So. I'll start with the macro model and I'll go back, I'll go into my own personal experience. So going back to money as a tool in, for your own fulfillment, right? Your money, your time, your money, that's a tool for fulfillment. And 
w- one of the things that fulfill you is time with your kids. But also one of the things that fulfill your kids is time with you. So a lot of people are like, oh, I'm working hard and it's for my children and I'm going to give them money. And that money, they would take that money and they would convert it into experiences that fulfill them, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But one of the experiences that they want to have is time with you. So by actually going out to work for more money to give it to them, you're actually giving them less fulfillment and less of what they want, the experiences they want to have, right? There's a balance, you know, but if they, if you pass away, you know, you can't do this up until infinity. If you pass away, they would probably give a significant portion of the money that you left them or when you give them at 30, if you do it optimal, left them for more time with you when they were 14, 15, 16, whatever age it is, right? They say, I don't want the money. I want the time. I don't mm-hmm. want the money. That, that, you know, I want the time that you use to convert that into money. Let's rewind that back. Hey, God, can I give you the money and rewind the clock back? You can't do that. So you have to think about that, right? And I hear, I hear that excuse a lot. Well, I'm working for the kids. I'm like, the kids? Are you really working for the kids? Are you really thinking about the experiences they want to have? Like, you know, particularly people that have already covered the school and, and et cetera, right? They, they don't want the house. They don't want the extra extra foof. They want the, this experience, right? And their balance. And I, I can't speak for everyone or whatever. Some kids, I hate them. You know, I don't want to be yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I, I, I don't just, really I, like my dad. I, just, I think <laughs> this is just something to consider. And so this is something that hit me hard later. And I realized like, you know, in the book, I talk about watching poo movies with my daughter and how I really loved it. And until my daughter said, you know, that's a, that's a baby movie. I don't want to watch that movie anymore. Right. Like I missed that time. Right. Maybe I shouldn't have been out playing poker with the boys. Maybe I should have been home watching poo movies or reading books with my kids that I didn't properly allocate the time. Right. I can play poker until 90. Right. I, there's old guys at the table that are, you know, on their deathbed playing poker. Right. And, and, but I don't get to read books or watch poo movies with my kids. Right. So I did a suboptimal job of allocating my time and, and, and time bucketing. Right. And this is before I had the concept of time bucketing. Right. This is why that concept comes out. Right. And so I am not the Dalai Lama of being off autopilot. I, I wrote this book for me. I had all these thoughts and ideas, you know, not in an organized format. Right. But these concepts that I wanted to save my own life. Right. Like my fear is wasting my own life. And this helps me snap out of autopilot. And I have. And now a spouse that keeps me accountable, like, Hey, wake up. You're on autopilot. You're, you're, you're an NPC, non-playable character mode, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Like let's, let's, let's get back on, let's get back to intention. What's the, what do we, what do we really want to be doing here? What do we want out of this period of our life? What experiences should we be having? And so that was one of the things that is my, my experience. And I, I do it all the time. Like I, I, am I going to do this with my kids? Or am I going on this trip? I mean, that it's a constant question and, and I'll never get it perfectly right. Right. But I do believe by being intentional, thinking about it, I am minimizing waste and I'm getting it <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. less wrong. I'm getting it less wrong, right? Like I'm getting it less wrong. And so that is driving more fulfillment in my life, a much a richer life for both myself and my children. Yeah. And I think Bill, you and I could spend an entire show talking about how to not be an NPC, which is a conversation that yeah. I have with my children all the time now, because it's becoming such a big vernacular within the youth is NPCs and living your right. life. So I, so I talk to them all the time about how to not be an NPC, but let, let let's just shift in a, in a, a different direction as we as we wind up. And so I'll throw four rapid fire questions at you. Okay. Uh, your money or your life very impactful for you. What's one other book that's had a huge impact on your life? Number one book is um, the Four Agreements. The Four Agreements, excellent. It, whenever, so if somebody asked me about trading. You're a trader. I want to trade. I was like, well, the first book I recommend is the Four Agreements. Huh. It's 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 always the first book I recommend. Okay, I'm going to have to explore trading, that one. Life, whatever, it's the four agreements. Okay, uh, I will give that one a read. And what's on the bookshelf right now? I see a number of books behind you, but what is Bill reading right at the moment? Well, I have Outlive, and I think it's The Open Road. But Peter Atia wrote okay. a book called Outlive. And you know, one of, you know, there are three variables, right? And each variable, your wealth, your health, and time, uh, which drive, you know, drive your fulfillment. 
those macro variables. And the health is so important, right? It's not only longevity, but your, your ability to do things, your health span as opposed to your lifespan. And so, you know, I use the, uh, an example, like when I, when I was younger, I used to stay the summer in a city, a foreign city. I thought if I went to a different city each year for the summer, after like 10 years, I would be an interesting person. So I went to Paris and I used to walk like 12, 15, I used to walk Paris all day with a backpack on. And you, when you stay there for three months and you're walking and you're taking immersive learning, you really get to know Paris, right? As opposed to the tourists, like, hey, I went to the Eiffel Tower, I went to the Louvre, I went, you know, the kind of that McDonald's cookie cutter version. Now I can walk five miles a day before it starts to get like, eh, not feeling it. My knees are bothering me. It's not that I couldn't walk 12 miles, but it would be painful. I wouldn't get as much fulfillment. So mm. now when I go to Paris, it's actually a less fulfilling trip than before it's still fulfilling but it's less fulfilling okay right? so getting that right like thinking about these things and my decay right like where, where do things go so like my go city my walking cities like now i prioritize walking cities over non you know not more drivey cities or you know public transportation cities than you know that order because i you know i, I won't be able to do the walking if you put the walking cities last and the you know, the subway and bus cities early, then you kind of don't get the walking cities as well. You don't get the maximum fulfillment, right? And so that's that's one of the things. I mean, digression, but you also notice, and, and I think this does tie to what we were talking about with food and obesity. Most of the walking cities tend to be European cities because we're, yeah. we're in Vancouver, BC, very walkable, and we're always considering what might be a future home base. And, we, you know, we just spent a week in Texas and – Loved it, had a great time with our boys, but eliminated it from the list because there was there was no there very was few very walk- little walking. Very few walking cities. I mean, Austin can be downtown in that area, but uh, there's very few walking neighborhoods. You know, it's not not that much around there, and, and the ones that are, are very expensive or you know enclaved off, etc. Which like, basically like brings you home. Like, I used to walk you know seventy two blocks when I was in Manhattan. Yes, and that's what Leslie always brings up is she's like, other than New York, we haven't found an American city where we walk. But when we go to Europe, we we walk everywhere. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's beautiful that way. Uh, what's one thing you've spent less than $1,000 on in the last 12 to 18 months that you've thought, wow, I wish Bill had bought this earlier? Wow. What a question. What have I $1,000? I mean, you probably what? bought it two years ago because you were like, I'm going to want that in two years. I, I can, I, I'll, I'll give you something in two years. The digital picture frames. Oh, okay. So I'm big on the memory dividend. And so yes. anything that induces the memory dividend, it, it increases my fulfillment. So today, when I got up, was getting dressed, this funny picture popped up. We have, we have, them, we have a couple. We have one for our wedding, and that's just that. One are just friends and goofing off. And I, there was this picture that, like, from seven years ago with my then girl I was dating, who's now my wife, you know, goofing off on her birthday party, et cetera. And, and I chatted in a group and brought it up and it was like, look at this crazy picture. And they're like laughing and look how young, you know, and it, it sparked a conversation. And that to me is, I was like, wow, I wish I had that earlier. Oh, beautiful. I love it. And because this show is about growth, what's one habit, mindset, shift, behavior change you've made in your life that's had an oversized impact for you? Well, I wrote the whole book to do it. I think I think the habit of thinking when is the best time for an activity, but I, I think I don't. I think that's almost a cop out because I think there's a better habit I have. It, it's probably going to be health related. I think putting the phone in the bathroom when you go to sleep at night or away from you so you cannot reach it that that is probably some of the best. Habit. I mean, it's going to sound like kind of crazy. Like, wait, what did he just? Say? But sleep is so important, and I am a a constant diddle on the phone guy in the bed yes and if the phone is there i will think of something and then i will grab the phone then i won't go to sleep and then i have five hours of sleep and then i'm miserable the next day etc so making sure that phone is away because if you change the difficulty in behavior design right like we're all trying to behavior design ourselves into success the more difficult an action is the less likely it's going to be done consequently the more easy it is it'll just happen just put a bag of chips out It'll be in your pantry, but if you open and put a chip, you'll start eating the chips. In the pantry, you won't eat. It. You would have made a decision to go in the pantry, and, and if it's not in your house, you won't eat them at all, right? Like you won't. I'm not going to drive to the store, even though driving to the store is not that big of a deal, 
right? And so the same thing happens, like small changes in difficulty lead to drastic changes in behavior. And we can use that to our advantage to stop unwanted behaviors or induce behaviors that we enjoy. Could have said um, putting the Peloton in, in my house. Massive change of behavior. I don't have an excuse like, oh, it's raining. There's a lot of traffic or whatever. It's like, nope, no excuse. It's right there. Go get on it. That small change in difficulty, big change in results. Moving the phone. So I, I think things like that are, you know, me thinking about how I, how am I going to take motivation out of it and just behavior design around? Yes. Yes. So, so I, I try absolutely and, I, motivation that goes up and down, up and up and down. But if I can change the difficulty back and forth, I can really change what my behavior will be and design for success. Oh, I love that one. And Bill, as we wind up, we went pretty wide. We went pretty deep on some of these things. Are there any final thoughts that we miss that you want to leave people with? I, I would say, I mean, we've been talking about them, but I would really think about the fact that you have one life and one ride. And no matter how you want to live a lot, live your life, make sure you're thinking about it and you're off autopilot. This book really is about living intentionally, right? It's mathematical, is uh, there's mental models, it's a counterfactual rent minimization algorithm for fulfillment. But none of that will get done unless you're off autopilot and thinking about it and being intentional. That is a wonderful way to end it. And where can people find you? Oh, wow. Well, if you like hot takes, I'm at BP22 on Twitter. I don't know if you can handle that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm Bill Perkins. And that's just my life. I use Instagram as kind of like my memory, my future self memory dividend giver. Right. So I, wherever, what I'm doing, I, I, I have random stories of my life and trips. Sometimes it's glamorous. Sometimes it's mundane. Sometimes it's very interesting. And sometimes it's like, what the, what the hell? <laughs> but uh, th that's me, Bill Perkins on Instagram. And that's generally where you can find me. Awesome. We'll get all that in the show notes. And thank you for joining me today on The Growth Guide. That was a blast. Thanks for having me. If you like the podcast, you'll love our new newsletter, The Growth Guide. Every Thursday, straight to your inbox with the goal to help you be better, achieve more, and become financially free. Check it out at our website, thegrowth.guide. Subscribe and learn more.